Hello and welcome. Let's try this again. See if the recording actually works this time. The last time there was skipping and popping. So for this lecture, we are going to look at the study of human development. So we are going to look at the, the basics of what is human development. So we're kind of going to do a preview of the course in many ways, but it's more of a preview of what is development. For this, we are going to look at what is development, we're going to look at the phases of the lifespan, we're going to look at the lifespan perspective, we're going to look at five developmental issues, developmental theories, and where we are today. So why are we looking at these? So wh what is development? Um, we have to look at this because the, the question of how we define development is actually a tricky question. It is a question that is debated. How about phases of the lifespan? Same thing, it is something that is debated. I could give you a hundred phases of the lifespan. We're only gonna look at five though. And then we're gonna look at development as a lifespan perspective. And we're gonna get into some of the issues of development that people have. Let's start with that, what is development? So development is, and this is where I'll ask you, to think about it okay what is development what do you think development is and as i said there there this is a point of contention this is a point and it's not really a point of contention anymore amongst developmental theorists but it's been a point of contention what classifies or what counts as development and the definition is actually relatively simple that is development is systematic changes and stabilities in an individual that occur between conception and death so what are we looking at here? What's the important components of this? First is changes and stabilities. So development isn't just what we would classify, classically define as gains. You, you grow up, you get bigger, you, your, your brain matures, all of that. So we can't just say it's maturation. We look at development as more than that, just that. We look at it as changes. And within changes, you can have both gains, losses, and neutral changes. So changes that are, are neutral in nature, but neither a gain nor a loss. And development actually even counts stability. So if you've, you've got periods of your life where you're stable, where you have stability, where not much is changing, that is still considered development. And then the other component of this is that it occurs between conception and death. And that's really the big thing to, to consider here is development starts at the moment of conception and it goes all the way to death. It's not something that occurs until you're in adolescence or until you've reached an adult reached adulthood. It is something that, that begins at conception and goes all the way throughout the lifespan to death. So let's look at that a little bit more. So development involves gains losses and neutral changes so this is changes but also stabilities in each phase of the lifespan to expand on that a little bit more a couple ways to look at it is as both growth and aging so as we age we we get bigger but then as we get even older we we actually shrink a little bit so we get smaller those are both gains and losses when we're in middle adulthood we have some neutral changes we have some stabilities and all that is part of development You've also got things like this physical growth. So when we're looking at Arnold here, when he was younger, he was very muscular. Then when he got older, he's still pretty muscular. He's still stronger than most people, but he has lost a lot of his muscle. That is a developmental change. Losing the muscle like he has is a developmental change. We're going to look at development in three main domains, physical, cognitive and social so we're going to look at these changes and stabilities that occur within these now there's two different ways to teach this class one is to do it where you break the semester into weeks on the physical then weeks on the cognitive then weeks on the social another way to do it is to and there's actually three ways the second way to do it is to go chronologically so look at a child as they grow into adolescence into adulthood into old age that type of thing um, the third way to do it is kind of a mix of the two which is the way we're going to be doing it in this class and that is 
we will look at each phase of the lifespan, but we'll then look at separate physical, cognitive, and social. So if you look at the syllabus, you'll see that that's the way it's set up. Physical is going to be more it's self-explanatory, growth, muscle, and, and just the physical characteristics. Cognitive is the mind how the mind and how the mind interacts with the environment, how the mind interprets the environment. So behavior will fall under cognitive and well, at least mental behaviors. And then social is the last one. Social is going to look at things like peer friendships, relationships, um, and, and various different social things that, that we develop as we grow older. Next, let's look at the phases of the lifespan. So the phases of the lifespan, this is a, a interesting thing because uh, the different scientists, different um, domains like sociology and whatnot, look at the phases of the lifespan very differently. Some look at it as having many phases of lifespan. Some look at it as fewer. I will say that there is a argument for many, many, many phases of the lifespan. You could look at it as so you've got um, uh, different phases of fetal development. We'll, we'll talk about that. So you've got three main different phases of fetal development. That could be three different phases of lifespan. Then you've got early infancy, late infancy, toddlerhood, early childhood, middle childhood, late childhood, early adolescence, middle adolescence, late adolescence, on and on and on. Even adulthood can be broken down into early, middle, and late adulthood. And some actually even break it down into four or five phases of adulthood, or not adulthood, but old age. Some even break them down into four or five phases rather than just old age, early old age, middle old age, old old age. Um, and so it, it can be pretty complicated. However, for the purposes of this class, we are going to look at five phases of the lifespan. We're going to start with childhood. Childhood is everything from conception until adolescence. Uh, so everything from conception to about 12 or 13 is where we will classify it. Next is adolescence. Adolescence begins at the classical sign of puberty. Now, we'll, when we talk about puberty, we'll talk about how that actually isn't the actual start of puberty. Actual start of puberty tends to start at around ages six to eight when um, the biological changes and, and chemical changes in the body start. However, that isn't what we classically define as puberty. We classically define puberty by Andrarch and Menarch which is basically our, our classic definition of starting of puberty when we when we look at it. So that is the, that that classical definition um, is where we will start adolescence. So about 12 to 13, sometimes a little bit earlier, sometimes a little bit later. Adolescence goes until emerging adulthood. Now this is a variable time as well. Some people end adolescence at, at 20, some end it at 18. However, we are going to generally and it's, it's a loose definition, but we're going to generally define adolescence going until brain development finishes. And brain development doesn't finish until about the age of 22. There's actually some scientists that, that now believe that brain development doesn't finish until 26-ish, but we're going to end adolescence at about 22. That doesn't mean emerging adulthood doesn't start necessarily earlier, but it, it, again, it's a fuzzy definition of this, this transition. Emerging adulthood, this is going to be the time in someone's life where, they're where they are um, going through a lot of changes. College, getting a job, uh, developing a relationship, having children, uh, maybe getting a house, homestead. All of these things are these ideas or things that happen in emerging adulthood before you get middle age. Middle age is defined by stability, generally. So it is that, that t period of time where, where all of those things from emerging adulthood have been settled before you get to empty nest and retirement. Old age, on the other hand, is more of that empty nest and retirement. So the kids have left the home and you've retired. So this is represented by another period of change. And in old age, you've got some of the losses that come with old age. And one of the, the issues here, and we'll talk about this later, is some people reach old age, retire, and just shut down. 
Um, they're no longer doing all the things they were doing when they were younger, so they shut down. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the cognitive in old age. So these are our five phases of the lifespan we will be looking at this semester. Um, we will be looking at each of these separate. As I said, you could easily break these down into more, especially childhood. So when we're actually talking about childhood, we'll kind of even break that down a little bit more. But these are the five phases that, that you can generally keep in mind for what we're going to cover. So next, let's talk about a modern lifespan perspective, modern day lifespan perspective of uh, psychology, of developmental psychology. First, it is that development is a lifelong process. We've already talked about how it's from conception to death. So it is a lifelong process. The next, it's multi-directional, meaning people develop in multiple different ways. They, they go in multiple different directions. Two different people who are raised in the same environment with the same genes can end up with two different developmental outcomes. But even if you, you diversify it even more than that, you get many, many more developmental outcomes. Develop, in, development involves both gains, losses, stabilities, neutral changes, all of those. Development is characterized by lifelong plasticity. That means the lifelong ability to, to respond both, pos to po both positive and negative experiences in the environment, to respond and change to the environment. Next is development is shaped by a historical context, um, a historical cultural context. This is in getting at the fact that um, history and the culture we are in shapes how we develop. It's why some people in some cultures develop in different ways at different times, but we'll come back to that later. Development is multiply influenced, meaning there are lots of different things that influence development. You've got genes, you've got environment, but you've got lots of different things within the genes and environment. And development must be studied by multiple disciplines. This is kind of self-explanatory, but it's not just psychologists that should be studying development and not just developmental psychologists. Okay, now let's look at some developmental issues. So we've got five main developmental issues we're going to talk about. These are issues that are within development that we have to consider whenever we're talking about development. First is nature versus nurture. We'll have slides for each of these. Next is goodness versus badness. Are people inherently good or inherently evil? Activity versus passivity. Are people active in their development or are they just passive along for the ride? Continuity versus discontinuity. Is development continuous or is there, there period breaks or a periods of abruptness? And finally, universality versus context dependency. Is development universal across cultures and domains or is it dependent on the context? Let's start with a fun one, nature versus nurture. So in the debate of nature versus nurture, the debate is are humans products of our genes or our environment? Are we products of our genes, nature, which means we are all the, or the main thing and what influences us is heredity, our genes. Um, so there's an emphasis on maturation, on the, the, the biological predisposition and we develop biologically according to a genetic plan. That is the nature side of the argument. The nurture side of the argument is that the environment is what's important. Or one way it's said is tabula rasa, that is the blank slate. So humans are blank slates to be written on by the environment. So those who support strong nurture are um, basically emphasize learning as the main component of development that the experiences environment cause changes in thoughts, feelings, and behavior. So now I'll ask you, which do you think is more important in development? And if you say it's nature, you're wrong. If you say it's nurture, you're wrong. The actual true answer, trick question, is both. They both play a pretty equal role. In some parts of development, nature is stronger. In some parts of development, nurture is stronger. But in general, they play a pretty equal role. 
we have genetic predispositions and these are important they do shape development they do influence everything but then the environment acts on those genetic predispositions to result in outcomes so without the environment we don't get those outcomes without the genes we don't get those outcomes so it's both and we will talk about um, this later at the end of the slides i'll give a really interesting graphic on glasses and how um water and it'll make sense at the time and how this all works and and how you get this interaction between genes and environment next is the question of goodness versus badness are humans inherently good or are humans inherently evil uh, or bad if you don't want to use the term evil uh, so in this one, and we're talking now about genetic predispositions, not about environmental factors, but about genetic predispositions. Uh, and in actuality, if I asked you, do you think people are inherently good or inherently bad? There's actually evidence that we have biologically based tendencies to be both good and bad, depending on the domain. What becomes important here is actually, again, going back to nature versus nurture, the environment. So even if you've got biological tendencies for to be bad, your environment might raise you still to ignore those tendencies, to embrace the tendencies of being good. Uh, so this is one of those where you look at that, that there is definitely genetic predispositions. And when you look at it from evolutionary perspective, um, and we'll, we'll look at that later, but how, um, some of the the adaptations could that we've evolved could be leaning more towards being bad because they give us an advantage now that being said we still have culture to consider the next debate or challenge is are humans active in their development or are we just along for the ride passively shaped by forces beyond our control and if you've kind of guessed which one is the case that it's both then you are correct uh, just like the others so at times we are active like the person at the at the helm but at other times we are basically just along for the ride like with that that the helm that's tied um so it, it's basically context dependent on the developmental issue we're talking about as well as what's going on with the environment uh, sometimes because we're active in our own development we can choose our environments even though our environments affect our development we can choose our environments we can shape our environment which shapes our development but at other times there are things that are occurring beyond our control um, things that are more strongly genetic tend to be more beyond our control next challenge continuity versus discontinuity are changes over the lifespan gradual like a gradual slide not like the ones you see in this picture or are they abrupt like stairs do we have gradual changes that gradually change over time or do we have these abrupt changes and if you guess just like the other ones it's a little bit of both you are correct it's more like the slides you see in this picture where there's abrupt drops as well as gradual drops we have periods of development where it's a gradual change we also have periods of development where there's rapid change you look at this with like growth when you're talking about height we have growth spurts we go to we have grow, go through we've got two main growth spurts we go through in our lifetime and between those you have a period of gradual change and then after it you have a period of stability so it's it is both continuity and discontinuity I already said I already talked about this continuity theorists talk about development being gradual discontinuity theorists look at development as being abrupt the final one is universality versus context dependency or context specificity and in this the question is are developmental changes common to all humans or different or are they different across cultures subcultures contexts, and individuals and sticking with the theme it's actually both there are human universals when we look at things like the basic emotions we find those in all humans all normal humans i would say you get you get abnormal cases but in a a typical human in all cultures you have the same emotions you have the same facial expressions to emotions however 
there are cost cultural differences and that is when you express those emotions that type of thing so that and that goes for a lot of different traits there's universals but there's also cross-cultural differences next let's talk about the developmental theories so i'm not going to go into too much detail on these you'll get a lot more from a, uh, the introductory psychology class I just kind of want to go over them a bit as they relate to development. Before we get to the actual theories, we do have to kind of give some stipulations for analyzing the theories, as well as a, a caution to looking at the theories. First, for a theory to be valid, it has to be internally consistent, which means if you give a test by one experimenter or one uh, clinician researcher whatever to someone and you get another researcher gives the the same test you should get the same result or and if someone takes a test one day and they take the test another day they should get the same results that makes it internally consistent the next is it should be falsifiable doesn't need necessarily mean it has to be false it just means that you have to have a way that you can scientifically study it and the only way you can do that is if it's possible to prove it false through a study and the final is is it needs to be supported by the data now the cash in, caution or the caveat that is study populations so most traditional research most research prior to the last 30 years, and even some in the last 30 years, was conducted on middle to upper class white males. It's just because that was who the study populations were. So it's something to consider when you're looking at these early theories that, that even though we know that they're wrong now, maybe they are right to a lesser extent, at least about middle to upper class white males, but not about the population as a whole. So let's first start with psychoanalytic theory. I told you I was gonna go through these pretty brief. This is probably one of the briefest I'll go through. Psychoanalytic theory believes that human have intrinsic unconscious, mo unconscious uh, motivations to behavior. These instincts that are unconscious. Um, that humans possess psychic energy. It's divided amongst the id, the ego, the superego, and this is, shapes personality. And finally, that children move through five stages. Now I will say that children moving through five stages is a thing that, that there is, it, it got us on the right track, but the rest of it that there's really no evidence for. So psychoanalytic theory that no one really follows anymore, it's not internally consistent, it's not falsifiable, and it's not supported by the data. The next theory we're gonna talk about is psychosocial theory. So psychosocial theory um, proposed by Erickson is essentially where uh, people go through stages in life so it takes that stages from Freud and one thing with Erickson is is he liked psychoanalytic he just didn't like that the all the unconscious stuff so he wanted to look at more social stuff so the stages he had and there is seven stages and they they go from basically birth to later in life so at least along the lines of um, what what we're looking at in development this is more accurate however there's a problem and that is that only one of these stages ever had data to really support it can you guess what stage that is i'll give you just a second to think about it while i talk about this so this theory is internally consistent it is not falsifiable that's unfortunate um it's not falsifiable because a lot of these things aren't something that's testable and it's only partially supported by the data and what do we have data to support the one um, stage and that is identity versus identity confusion and that is something we will talk about in detail when we get to adolescence because there is a lot of support for that people going through a, a challenge of identity and formation of identity the next theories is a set of theories and these are the learning theories um, so for these you've got um, these focus on how learning affects behavior so the the learning theorists were really fed up with all of this stuff that wasn't testable all of this stuff that happened in the brain and they wanted to do something that was testable so they started focusing on external behavior 
So this external behavior it emphasizes experience. So the le early learning theorists were all in the nature versus nurture. They were all in the nurture side, all in the environment. And the focus is on how consequences of actions influence behavior and how people learn from watching others. There's three branches of this classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and social cognitive theory. I will be talking about classical and operant. I will not be talking about social cognitive theory um, simply because what I would do there is show you a video. Um, I tried making in, integrating the video into these slides and I just couldn't get it to work for this one video. I can get it to work for others, just this one was being stubborn. So I've just dropped that slide out. Um, but if you are interested, go watch stuff on Bandura and the Bobo doll experiments. And, and aggression. I believe in the slides I sent you separate, you can actually get to that video still. But in this recording, I have cut it out. First, we'll start with classical conditioning. Classical conditioning was Watson and um, the, the famous little Albert experiment in which little Albert was trained to fear a white rat and then even more things that were white. Initially, you had the um, preconditioning phase. In the preconditioning phase, uh, the white rabbit or white rat, um, both were exposed to him. The white rat was was shown to little Albert. He had no response because he, he hadn't learned fear of it yet. And then what you get is then you start looking at this unconditioned stimulus that causes an unconditioned response. So in this case, an unconditioned stimulus is the loud noise, a banging of sticks that's a loud noise. This loud noise, we know, causes fear. It elicits fear. So you have an unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response. The unconditioned stimulus is the noise. The unconditioned response is the fear. The white rat is not included in this step. Then that unconditioned stimulus, that loud noise, is paired with the neutral stimulus. The neutral stimulus being the thing that little Albert is not afraid of, the white rat. So every time little Albert sees a white rat, um, a loud noise is made. So this unconditioned stimulus is paired with the neutral stimulus. Next, the neutral stimulus then becomes associated with the unconditioned response. So the white rat, because every time he sees the white rat now, he's having fear. The fear is because of the loud noise, not because of the rat. But internally, that fear starts to become associated with the white rat as well. So the neutral stimulus becomes associated with the unconditioned response, ending up with that neutral stimulus becoming the conditioned stimulus, the conditioned stimulus is now the white rat, and the unconditioned response becomes the conditioned response. The conditioned response is that fear. Next we'll talk about his operant conditioning with Skinner. So you've, you've got Skinner was that the, he believed that people tended to repeat behaviors that have desirable consequences and reduce behaviors that have undesirable consequences. We talk about this in development because there's a lot of evidence for this being true, at least to a limited extent. Um, so you've got in our picture here, you've got a rat in a cage pushing the lever is the, the, the um, trigger and then food is the outcome. So trying to get the rat to touch the, the, the lever. The, the trigger. So the outcome that's desired or the behavior, not the outcome that's desired, the behavior that, that is that wants to be repeated is pushing the lever. With this, you've got two different components. You've got reinforcement and you've got punishment. Let's talk about these. So you've got four different types of um, actions that can be done to increase or decrease behaviors. We'll talk about reinforcement first, and we'll talk about positive versus negative. And I have to really point out, really emphasize, the positive and negative here doesn't mean good and bad. Positive and negative means addition and subtraction. So uh, I will even write it on addition and subtraction. So Positive and negative are addition and subtraction. When you're talking about reinforcement, and by the way, the positive and negative work the same for punishment. So addition and subtraction. Let's look at reinforcement first. A positive reinforcement is the addition, 
So reinforcement is the, the outcome. Let's go back to that. The outcome for reinforcement is to increase behavior. With reinforcement, you're trying to increase the behavior. The result of punishment is you're trying to decrease the behavior. So positive reinforcement is when you add something wanted. So the addition of something wanted in order to increase the behavior. It can also decrease the behavior as well. If you don't do the behavior, you add something wanted. But it works more for increasing a positive behavior by adding something wanted when they do a positive behavior. A negative reinforcement is the subtraction of something unwanted. So the subtraction of something unwanted in order to increase the behavior. So if somebody does something good, you take away something they don't want. Uh, so an, an example of positive um, reinforcement would be um, paying someone. It's, it's one of the, the biggest things we have in society. We pay people for, for their work. So that is positive reinforcement that you're given every week for doing your work. Um, negative reinforcement is the subtraction of something unwanted. Let's say you, you've been, your kid has been grounded, taking, removing that grounding, subtracting something unwanted to increase the behavior. They've got a curfew, taking away the curfew, removing the curfew so they can stay out later to, because they did something good or you kept doing something good is something that's a negative reinforcement. Punishment, on the other hand, is designed mainly to reduce behavior. Just like reinforcement, it can be done to both increase the behavior or decrease the behavior, or increase a good, decrease a bad, but it's mainly done to decrease the behavior. So positive punishment is the addition of something unwanted. And negative punishment is the subtraction of something wanted. So an example here of negative punishment, subtraction of something wanted, you, you take away their freedom. You, you ground a kid, something like that. Positive punishment is the addition of something unwanted. This would be something like spankings. Um, that would be a positive punishment. In general, when you're talking reinforcement and punishment, reinforcement is a much better method than punishment. It doesn't mean there isn't times for punishment, but reinforcement is a much better method than punishment. And if you're going to do punishment, negative punishment tends to be better than positive punishment. Now, when we're considering the learning theories, uh, there's a few things, uh, challenges to learning theories we need to take into consideration. One of them is something called change blindness. If we were doing it in person, I'd give you a, a GIF with a change blindness going on. Can't really do that on these slides. Again, it's something I've tried and it just doesn't work outright. Um, but change blindness is where something in the environment changes. And the way this is tested is, is you have a brief period of time where the screen goes blank and then it, the picture comes back up with something changed. Why does change blindness kind of uh, disprove, not necessarily fully disprove, but counteract some of learning theories? Well, that's because with change blindness, when it comes to spotting changes, um, people are much better at spotting changes when it's something that that moves especially when you're talking about things like snakes um and, and different animals we are less good at, at spotting things that are inanimate so one of the the interesting ones out there is a kayaker in the water and there's a mountain in the background and the screen is flashing and a full third of the mountain is disappearing and then reappearing and then disappearing and then reappearing um it takes most people 10 to 15 seconds to spot that that mountain is disappearing. So it takes a while. However, if you see another one where there's a snake that you can barely see in the grass, we're not talking about something that's like a third of a mountain. We're talking a snake that you can barely see in the grass. That changes and people spot it almost immediately. It's a very quick thing that people spot. And that is because people have these instincts built into them, genetic predispositions. Learning theories are all about the environment. Genetic predispositions go against that. Another one to consider is um, instincts in things like raccoons. So raccoons, um, they, there's an experiment where they have them drop something in a slot and they're given food. 
should be a, a very simple thing. Um, if they're asked to do other tasks, they, they learn them right away when they're given food. But dropping the thing in the in the slot, they actually have trouble with. They might drop it a few times, get food, but they go to to put drop the thing in the slot again, and the, the thing they're dropping in the slot is not food, by the way. It's usually like a plastic coin. And they're dropping this coin in the slot. They start just dipping it in and pulling it out, dipping it in and pulling it out. That's because raccoons have instincts to wash their food. So these instincts override the, the conditioning. So it shows that there is some counteractions to it. So when we look at the learning theories, they are internally consistent, they are falsifiable, and they are mostly supported by the data, but they're not fully supported by the data. That is because the learning theories discount genetics. They only look at environment. And we can't consider development without considering both the genes and the environment. The last one we'll talk about before we get to the contemporary theories is um, cognitive developmental theory. Um, we're going to just briefly talk about this because later we're going to talk about this much more. So this is Piaget's theory, and that is that kids go through four stages. So this harkens back to stages, but now we've got stages that are much more accurate. There's still questions about it. There's still issues. But we've got these four stages, the sensory motor stage, where children begin to interact with the environment through their senses. Um, this is for about the first two years of life. Then for about um, four to five years after that, kids go through pre-operational stage where they start to represent the world symbolically, can learn to read, can learn to write, things like that. But they still have some challenges of, with thinking during this stage. The concrete operational stage, which comes after that and goes until adolescence, is where, where children overcome the issues of the pre-operational stage. And then finally, you have formal operations, which is where adolescents start to think abstractly about things like um, uh, the future, um, hard to, to think about um, uh, ba basically hypotheticals, um, things like love, all of that come in adolescence. Now, there's some challenges to this. Um, some of the challenges are that not everyone reaches formal operational stage in most of their thinking. And also, there's actually stages beyond this, two main stages beyond this, that some people reach in some domains. So uh, this is internally consistent, it's falsifiable, and it's actually mostly supported by the data. Um, it's, it was a little bit narrow in scope. Piaget really only studied his kids and a few kids, so it was really narrow. It, it underestimated kids in a lot of ways, but we'll talk about that later. Next is the contemporary theories. So the contemporary theories that we're going to talk about, and we'll, we'll, we're going to go into some of them a little bit and some of them a little bit more later, but you've got ecological systems theory, um, you've got sociocultural perspective, you've got behavioral genetics, evolutionary perspective, and information processing. These are the five main ones. There's a lot of different contemporary theories I'm not listing here that people follow parts of, but these are the five main ones when it comes to development. Let's start with ecology of development or ecological systems theory. This was um, developed by Uri Braffenbrenner and he was he basically um, explained how he was the first one to really look at how biology and the environment interact in development. He looked at all of these different other theories and he kind of looked at how, well, it's got to be a mixture of both. And he's the one who came up with systems theory, looking at things like um, we've got our microsystem, which is our immediate environment, our mesosystem, which is the links between our immediate environment. So our, our micros are our, like our family classroom, um, peer group, different things like that. The mesosystems is the things that links these together. The exosystems is the, the social systems. Um, so we look at like mass media, community, school, uh, all of these types of things. Then the macro system is our culture, our larger, larger cultural context. So this is where you get things like customs, cultural values, um, and economy and conditions, all of these type of uh, cultural and societal things. Um, and then finally, you get the chrono system, which is that all of this is occurring over time. Uh, many of the people who look at systems theory leave out the chrono system, but the chrono system is important because these are things that are changing over time. 
So the next is a sociocultural perspective, and this is Vygotsky. In Vygotsky, he really emphasized the impact of the social cultural influence on child development. He was really Im interested in how society and culture affect development. And he, he really focused on how um, culture is taught to children. And he, he was interested in how, how environment really impacted development and how cu different cultures actually impacted development differently. And one big thing is, is he viewed development as an apprenticeship. It's kids apprenticing to be adults. Um, prior to these, these, some of these scientists, mainly kids were just thought to be small adults. And really the, the scientists came along and said, no, that they're more like apprentices. They're more like learning to be adults, but they definitely aren't adults. Another field or domain is behavioral genetics, and behavioral genetics is interested in the in inheritance of behavioral traits. And one thing that I don't want you to, to look at behavioral genetics and think they're only concerned with genes. No, behavioral genetics is probably one of the most interactionist fields you'll look at. They are interested in how genes and environment affect development and what percentage of our development is influenced by genes and what percentage by environment. So what they do is they use twin studies. Um, there's a Minnesota twin study where there's thousands of pairs of twins that, that participate in different research studies. Some of the twins are identical, some are fraternal, some twins are raised together, some twins are raised apart, some of the identical twins raised apart or together, some of the fraternal twins raised apart and together. And what ex researchers do is they go and look at these twins and look at outcomes, developmental outcomes, things like let's say intelligence. And they'll look at twins that are raised together, twins that are raised apart. They'll look at identical twins raised together versus identical twins raised apart, as well as fraternal twins raised together and fraternal twins raised apart. And see the differences based on the environments they were in. If two identical twins raised together are, are high, both high on a trait, but if they're raised apart, only one is high on a trait and the other is low on a trait, then you can, with that trait, you could say that the environment plays a profound effect on that trait. If two um, fraternal twins that are raised together and one is high on, on that trait and one is low, then you can say it's probably more genetics because they were raised in the same environment. And if you're only looking at one set of twins, you really can't tell too much. But when you look at hundreds of sets of twins, you can start to then identify various different things going on here. So behavioral genetics looks at how inheritance of behavioral traits works. And we'll look at that later and talk about things like heritability factor, which is the proportion of a specific trait that is linked to genetics and IQ is one of those that we'll look at. That's why I use that as an example. Next is evolutionary perspective. I am not going to talk about that right now. Why am I not going to talk about that right now? Because I'm going to talk about that in great detail upcoming. I believe it's even next week that I'm talking about evolution. So I'm going to go into evolution in great detail. I've got a really big lecture on evolution. I talk about this in, with development because Evolution is really important to development. You can't really under, fully understand development without understanding evolution and the evolutionary pressures that led to the developmental outcomes we have now. So, like I said, not going to talk about it more now. We'll talk about it later. Uh, the last one's information processing system. So, information processing system likens the 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 brain to like a computer. So it looks at um, thinking develops in much the way a computer works. Um, that we have mental hardware, which is our psychological structures, and we've got mental software, which is such as our cognitive abilities and how we process information, how we interact with the world, things like that. So it's, it's something to keep in mind when we're talking about the cognitive stuff that there's a lot of um, information processing approach that goes into the cognitive stuff we'll talk about this semester. Okay, I said I'd come to back to glasses and water. Let us look at these. So we're going to talk about the diathesis stress model now. The diathesis stress model is a model that looks at how genes and environment interact to result in outcomes. So you have these genetic predispositions and environmental factors. 
we'll start with the genetic predispositions, and that is these glasses we have here, the starting water level. Actually, let me erase that. Go back to this. I'm going to write it in a lighter one. Yep, that's easier to see. You've got the starting water level. The starting water level we have is your genetic predisposition. So the genes you're born with, and, and to, to, to avoid confusion, what I'm going to talk about on this slide is basically these glasses are traits. And if the glass overflows, a person expresses that trait. So let's say we're talking about depression. If the glass, if the water overflows the grass, that person becomes depressed. They, they express depression. We first got genetic predispositions. That is when you are born, your genes set you at a certain level. Some people like the one over here on the left start with a lot of resilience. They're, they're really resilient to depression. They've got a lot of genetics that are resilient. Some like the one in the middle are kind of in the middle of the two. And then the ones on, like the one on the right have a high predisposition to depression. It runs in their family. They've got a lot of genetics for it. And then we've got these are gen the genetic predispositions, but then we've got environmental factors. So we get these environmental factors. Um, these environmental factors, um, some, and that is still coming up too late. Let's see this one. Some fill up the glass some. Some empty the glass some. So these environmental factors are either pouring water into these glasses or taking water out of these glasses. And one thing that you have to consider is that just because this person over here on the right has a high predisposition, it does not mean they're going to have depression. Maybe they get, they have a, a good social network and they don't have any challenges in life. So they actually go down in water level. They don't end up overflowing. And as a result, they never display depression. However, this person on the left, it, just because someone has a very low predisposition doesn't mean they won't get it. This person on the left, they, they go through some, some challenges. Their parents get divorced. They, they grow up in poverty. Um, they get broken up with. They have um, an illness or something. It just fills up and fills up until it overflows, and then they get depression. So it's important to note that two people that have the same genetic predisposition, like twins, different environmental factors can fill up or reduce the glass so different so two people with the same genetic predisposition are not necessarily going to express it someone with a higher predisposition isn't necessarily going to express it over someone with a lower it depends on the environment it's easier for this person here on the right to to become depressed it's it takes less environmental factors however it, just because they've got a high predisposition doesn't mean they would become depressed I hope that I explain this well. If there's any one thing you learn in this entire lecture, this is the one thing. I'll even throw in a question on the exam from this just because this is such an important concept. Um, I, years ago when I was an undergrad, this is one of the, the things that, that stuck out the most in my mind is this diathesis stress model and how then how it works with gen genes and environment interaction. So let's finally look at where we are today. And this goes back to those developmental issues. We know that human development is a product of nature and nurture. We know that humans have predispositions to be both good and bad. We know that humans, both humans and the environment are active in development. We know that the development can be both continuous and discontinuous. And we know that um, development has both universals and context specificities. So that this, this is just where we are today, um, looking at it when we talk about those challenges. So in conclusion, we looked at what is development, we looked at the lifespan perspective, we looked at the five developmental issues, we looked at the developmental theories, we looked at where we are today, and hopefully I don't have to record this again. Thanks, come on back.